The European Parliament have a provisional agreement to introduce a continent-wide digital ID, which will definitely invade your privacy and your cybersecurity, but at least there's no secret plan to insert microchips under our skin, like conspiracy theorists warned years ago. Oh no! <laughs> Hello there, you Awakening Wonders. Thanks for joining us on our voyage to truth and freedom. How important it is that we stay together at this time and look for ways to move beyond division and conflict, even though the invitation to fight seems permanent and prevalent. We talk a lot about advanced ideas that seem sometimes to be implausible and ridiculous, but after the pandemic period, many of us have become more open to the notion that there might be plans to introduce regulatory measures that seem like they're more from science fiction than political fact. But the European Parliament have just established in principle the introduction of a Europe-wide digital ID. This will be connected to CBDCs, that means digital currencies. Remember when digital currencies were bad, when they were Bitcoin, when they were offline and difficult to control and a bit off-grid. They're bad, they're bad for the environment. Someone's gonna hurt themselves. You could have someone's eye out with that digital currency. Well, now that they're organizing it themselves from the United States to across Europe, suddenly they're okay. But more worrying than any of that is the the introduction of measures to be able to observe us, control us, shut us down, and even something like universal credit, which I've heard people talk positively about, could be used as a measure to impose more control. But to get us into this subject, let's have a look at Dutch MEP Rob Roos, who you may remember from when he confronted a Pfizer employee about whether or not there'd been clinical trials around transmission, and the results were interesting, but if on YouTube I'll have to hold back what I reveal. Here is Rob Roos, he's just come out of a meeting, he's all sort of like, it's too late guys, you see the end of the world now, it's the Matrix man. I should have not left Morpheus in that chamber next to the laboratory. Ah! I just left the room where we had the negotiations about the digital identity and I have bad news. The member states and the European Parliament came to an agreement. That means that probably not far from now, the digital identity will be uh, a fact in the European Union. Right after this agreement, Commissioner Breton said, now we have the digital identity wallet, we have to put something in it. And what he meant was the digital euro, also known as the central bank digital currency. And this is a very bad development. One of the defining myths of our culture is progressivism. Things are improving. We used to be cavemen, but look at us now. We've got all of these devices. Post-enlightenment, things have been improving more broadly. Many of you might be thinking, sensing, feeling deep inside yourself that in conjunction with evident and obvious progress in technology and medicine, there's been a kind of a decline, a deterioration, something that's difficult to define and perhaps exists in the realm of the spirit. Notice how these ideas were first of all spoken of as, you know, as with any particular potential scientific or technological project, I suppose, as pie-in-the-sky potentialities. And now they're being introduced in quite a gentle way. And in the pandemic, we discussed, didn't we, the possibility of, like, vaccine passports. That was discussed. And I think, because of independent media, many of these ideas received a lot of pushback and resistance. What I would ask you to be observant of is the possibility that once these ideas are discussed, presented to you, and somewhat normalised by the media, you'll see a bunch of stuff normalising it in the coming weeks and months, I imagine. I predict. I can predict this now. Let me know in the chat when you see it. What will happen is a situation will occur, and I'm not, this is not a conspiracy theory, I'm not saying that it'll be a false flag event, you know, or whatever. I'm just saying because of the way things are, there will be a war, there will be a pandemic, there will be an event, and during that event, they're going to say obviously now, we're going to have to use that digital ID thing we've been discussing, and we're going to have to advance that because it's not safe now. Remember how close we came in the pandemic to, you know, oh, in order to go to concerts, you're going to have to have had this medication. It, now, you know that it didn't prevent transmission. Now, you know like, there's so many things, you know, I'm not going to rehash all of that stuff now. What I'm saying is, is that any measure that ultimately affords centralised authority a greater ability to control you, to control your movements, to control your transactions, to control your finances, is ultimately not going to be in your service. That's why I think we live in such a polemicised and conflagratory time, a time of conflict, because most people in the back of their minds think, well, as long as these measures are only applied to the people I don't like, I'm kind of glad. Yeah, I don't mind if you cancel or silence those. I've never liked those people anyway. But once the principle is established, it's difficult to predict how it might... Well, it's not difficult to predict. I'm going to predict. It will be deployed in order to centralise authority and shut down any dissent towards the establishment. They always promise us not to make this connection. And even uh, a lot of experts, 
privacy experts and security experts warned also last week this is uh, a, a very uh, bad idea for our privacy and our freedom. The warnings of privacy and cybersecurity experts is something we'll cover in more detail in a minute. But you might notice that yourself, you have a kind of lethargy, a kind of an inability to confront it. You feel a bit worn out with all of the wars and diseases and this kind of atmosphere of our culture. You might be like, oh, God, just do it. What can I do anyway? You'll happily just accept that your role in a democracy is to choose one of these two basically the same political parties that are funded in the same way. I suppose what I'm inviting you to look at is the possibility of confronting and resisting what seems inevitable but is plainly being pointed out as undesirable. And still this digital identity is pushed through. But it's not too late because we still have to vote on this in the plenary. So what you can do, send your MEP from your member state an email and tell him or tell her that you are against this Tool. Some detail. The European Parliament and the majority of the member states reached a provisional agreement on the establishment of the European Digital ID or EID, the first central and fully digital identification system for all Europeans on Thursday. Conservative lawmakers and cybersecurity experts are sounding the alarms, citing concerns for potential large scale abuse. We are taking a fundamental step so that citizens can have a unique and secure European digital identity, Nadia Calvino, the Spanish Minister for Economy and Digital digitalization representing the European Council Spanish presidency said when there are ongoing migrant crises when there are feelings of broad antipathy towards migrants a digital ID becomes appealing it will be one of the ways that a variety of people will be induced into accepting a continent-wide digital ID oh well otherwise people that shouldn't even be here will be able to have access to they will use it's going to be for safety they'll use every single trick that is because of paedophile any imaginable conceivable notion will be used to legitimize it and normalise it. This process is beginning now. Under the new law, the EU will offer citizens so-called digital wallets on a voluntary basis. At first, at first, what a key phrase. Why don't you have a digital wallet? Is it voluntary? Yes, it is. Now, where is your digital wallet? Oh, I uh, left it at home. Well, then you're going to jail. Which will contain digital versions of their ID cards, driving licences, diplomas, medical records and bank account information. These documents will be recognised as means to access online services throughout Europe and citizens will be able to prove their identity or share electronic documents from their wallets with a click of a button, the legislators hope. So safe, so convenient, so easy. We've already been introduced to ideas, you know, using phones to pay for stuff, train tickets, using phones to make purchases. And of course, convenience is, you know, a thing, it's a factor. But what are you giving up? in exchange for that convenience. Where could it go? Remember, we've already had instances where people's bank accounts have been shut down, whether that's the Canadian truckers. We've already had instances where people's movements are monitored and controlled. Is that a capacity that you want to increase without due regulation and legislation? Notice it's taking place as well in a broad climate of censure and legislation to prohibit free speech. Notice that there's been a 180 on the efficacy and value of CBDCs that initially they were dismissed now it's like, oh no, they are a good idea actually thinking about it because we could switch people off financially. It's important to consider how these things might be used and whether or not they're going to be accompanied with legislation that meaningfully prevents them from being exploited. Just look at the 702 bill that's being perpetuated in the USA now, which was introduced for counter-terrorism measures that's never really gone away and is used essentially to spy on American citizens. Critics, however, see the EID as a building block of a coming European digital surveillance state. A way for the EU and and any government to hold all of their citizens' personal information and track their every move. That sort of thing already happens. Do you remember when we were all like, God, yes, security cameras are everywhere now. Do you remember that? They didn't used to be CCTV, but it's for your security. It's for your safety. It's normalised. Now that's just a thing that we all live with. Here's the next wave. The agreement was reached just days after 504 privacy and cybersecurity experts from 39 countries signed a joint letter strongly warning about the pitfalls of the legislation as it fails to properly respect the right to privacy 
privacy of citizens and secure online communications. The researchers and academics concluded that instead of protecting personal data, the current text substantially increases the potential for harm, both by rogue actors and government abuse. Curious that that potential would exist. Naturally, the Commission does not plan to stop at EIDs. Another major plan that's currently in the works is the digital euro, Europe's future central bank issued digital currency, CBDC, currently in early development phase by the European Central Bank. Now, as you know, we can't make this content without you and without our fine supporters. Did you know as well that the IRS October the 15th tax deadline has passed? And I know some of you will be feeling the pressure. If sorting through the complexities of expenses, payments and deductions has caused you failure to file, it could result in penalties piling up on your tax debt. The attorneys at Tax Network USA have successfully saved clients over $1 billion in tax debts. So whether you're looking at a $10,000 tax debt or a million dollar challenge, they can help you with a settlement. Even if you haven't filed in one year, five years, or a whole decade, they're ready to help you. Professionals at Tax Network can help resolve all cases, no matter how it started. Go to taxnetworkusa.com forward slash brand. Let's get back to the content. Critics who warn about total government control of citizens' personal finances through programmable money have long been saying that EIDs will be the first step toward an economy run on CBDCs. Internal Market Commissioner Thierry Breton has now even confirmed this as one of the main goals of the new legislation. Thierry Breton may have come to your attention with his weird bureaucratic gangster threats towards people like Elon Musk. I'm giving Elon Musk 24 hours to obey. He'll do as I say. Or he'll face Thierry Breton consequences. So I will respect the law. Looks like an old lady, talks like Don Corleone. This is a post of Thierry Breton's We did it, hashtag deal handshakes. With the European digital identity wallet, all European citizens will be able to have a secured e-identity for their lifetime. Yeah, cool, freedom. The wallet has the highest level of security and privacy. Cool, because yeah, security and privacy, that is where it'd be exploited. I'm glad, Thierry, that you have uh, pointed out that there's no room for that. And of course, we can definitely trust people in positions of power like you. Giant step and a world premiere round of applause to my teams and both co-legislators. And if that tweet or ex post hasn't made you excited enough about Thierry Breton's brilliant plan to observe your every move and to be able to shut you down financially like that, here's a piece of promo content that's going to make you want to bow down and worship at the centralised authority. You've got no choice. They can do what they want with you. Convenience and security, also friendly. It's like elevator music. It's like we're just being carried by a machine to an inevitable destination where we will have more convenience and more security. Is there any potential downside? Is there any potential downside? Not that I'm looking at or willing to declare publicly. Tick, nice control of personal data. See how it's like starts will be available to every EU citizen. Will be mandatory for every EU citizen. Yeah, secure throughout Europe. Once that's operating in conjunction with the WHO's treaty in the event of another pandemic, and pandemics can include all sorts of things that go beyond what you might think is a pandemic, including stuff like climate change. I'm just citing from the documentation. That means they'll be able to censor online content. They'll be able to track you wherever you're going. Can you sort of see where this is heading and see how people that sounded like mad, prophetic, conspiracy theorist, giddy shaman of a technological age just a few years ago, essentially were telling us plain truths in strange accents. They can decide what data they want to store and share for now. Don't matter if you're a builder, a fisherman, or that lady doing her work. It's for everybody. Proof of your skills and qualifications. Are you going to prove your skills? Yeah, I can prove my skills on my digital wallet. Are you going to prove your loyalty and obedience to the state? Um, no, sorry, too late. Prison! Like they're talking as if there's not been like massive problems with data hacking, data filing, huge swathes of data around the world being stored just so they've got it for when they need it. All this just upbeat selling of total dystopia. I'm convinced now that's what it looks like. It doesn't look like military uniforms. It doesn't sound like jackboots marching down a street no more. What it's like is this. It's all friendly. Yeah, it's going to be so convenient and safe. Why am I in this cell again? Convenient and safe gonna make life so much easier because I find life quite hard, do you? Yeah, why? Because of this sort of stuff actually. Yeah, 
remembering passwords. It's so exhausting not having people spy on my private information. It's coming. It shouldn't say stay tuned. It should say whether you like it or not. Because I don't remember voting for it. Remember? You're funding it, but did you vote for it? So, in conjunction with digital ID stroke digital wallets, we have this extraordinary announcement from the president of the Federal Reserve of Minneapolis, whose name sounds a lot like cash cards. Let me have a look. Neil Kashkari. He says CBDCs don't actually solve any problems. Oh, what, any? Well, I suppose you could shut down the finances of people you didn't agree with. That's one problem, Neil. Yeah, but I happen to not be a fascist. Central bank digital currency. Do you think that that is something that you all should be looking into seriously? How to, to what degree should you be looking into it seriously? Just what, what are your thoughts on CBDC? I mean, as the, uh, my colleagues at the Federal Reserve have talked about, we are examining it. Uh, I'll tell you my personal bias is I'm pretty skeptical. I keep asking anybody, anybody at the Fed or outside of the Fed, to explain to me what problem this is solving. A digital, I can send anybody in this room $5 with Venmo right now, <laughs> right? No, seriously, so what is it that a CBDC could do that Venmo can't do? I know, I know we can uh, unperson people that are dissidents and if anyone dissents against state interest, we can shut down their bank account. Oh no, that is quite good. And all I get is a bunch of hand-waving. I get a bunch, well, maybe it's better for financial inclusion. Maybe it's better for cross-border remittances. Maybe, is there any evidence that it is? And, you know, they say, well, what about China? China is doing it. Well, I can see why China would do it. If they want to monitor every one of your transactions, you could do that with the central bank digital currency. You can't do that with Venmo. Oh, now we're getting somewhere. It's not like we would just copy China, though, because China, they're very authoritarian. You know, like, remember, during lockdown, without any evidence at all, they started shutting people in their houses. They just abandoned democracy. Well, they didn't have to abandon democracy. They don't have democracy. That's why we, in the West, as democratic people and Republican people, we did the exact same. Ah! If you want to impose negative interest rates, you could do that with the central bank digital currency. You can't do that with Venmo. And if you want to directly tax customer accounts, you could do that with the central bank digital currency. You can't do that with Venmo. Venmo sounded pretty shit for tyrants everywhere. So I get why China would be interested. Why would the American people be for that? No choice, because they've got no choice, like everything nowadays, because probably both parties at some point will say we're both doing it, and then it will just happen, and then there'll be some disaster that legitimizes it, and then people will try and protest against that disaster. This is me being a trucker. This is what they're like. Boop, boop, we're truckers. And then you'll be like, you are unpersoned. You are unfinanced. You are going to be held in cells for a long, long time for basically no reason. And now, my fellow concerned Awakening Wonders, we get to where the rubber meets the road, or where the microchips meet the skin. We get into the conspiracy theories glory territory. Do you remember during the pandemic? It's not as if they're gonna, they'll never, they could never get away with, well, this is Richard Werner, who used to be a WEF insider. He's now turned whistleblower, talking about how these measures will lead to, and I've heard this said in like conspiracy theory circles before. First, they'll get technology that you don't want to put down, your phone. Then it'll be wearable technologies, like, you know, sort of Fitbits and watches that are connected to your phone and stuff you put into measured glucose. Then, sooner or later, they'll go, do you mind just putting this under your skin? How are they ever going to persuade us though, when we're so awakened, when we're so sharp, when we're so powerful and connected to one another, when we have such clear vision, how will they ever persuade us to do that? Well, this guy's been at the WF as a leader for tomorrow or a Klaus Schwab pig teeth sucker of yesteryear or whatever they call him. And he's giving us his insights. Let's have a look. Because it apparently looks, and, and several central banks apparently, as I, as I heard from my sources, have already fully developed the final stage of CBDC. I mean, it comes in stages initially, likely through your mo mobile phone, yeah. but it's only an intermediate step. Mm. And the final stage is, you know, it's, it's small and it's the size of a, a grain of rice. Now, why is that? <laughs> And it, it, that grain of rice is your entire wallet? or Yes, it's your digital ID, yeah. your wallet, uh, can be your, your, um, your passport, your key. Um, now, of course, what we found with our debit cards or credit cards is they've already now moved to the system, you know, RFID chips, um, RFID yeah. um, technology where you just wave the thing, yeah. contactless. Yes. That is sort of the, the, you know, conditioning us in this direction. That yeah. in the future you'll just wave your hand because you've got the microchip, the, chip. the microchip implant yeah. under your skin, yeah. um, and because you know, 
and each each step there's a rational reason you know it's it's easier just to wave this isn't it it's much faster because we always have to wait in the queues as everyone types in their numbers and all that so just wave it it's quicker uh, but the the next rationalization would be well but you can lose your card somebody can steal your card mm. and then you're just waving yeah. that's kind of risky well yeah. wouldn't it be nice if you couldn't lose it and nobody could steal it um, you know so but it's clear that that's sort of, it is almost a step too far for a lot of people because it is a violation of human dignity. Oh, human dignity. What does human dignity matter when I've got my old grain of rice embedded in there and I can just wave my way through life? Beep, beep, beep. Where are you taking me? I didn't like that little grain of rice. So how are they going to persuade people to have an embedded chip under their skin? And it sort of seems impossible and ridiculous, but just bear in mind some of the things that you were told in the last three years and some of the things that in mealy mouth mitigated and diluted ways being revealed, for example, in the COVID inquiry or the conversation between Rand Paul and various other senators. Think about how truth is slowly emerging and we're all just sort of adjusting I'm sure they were trying their best. We're just accepting it now. Obviously, some kind of crisis or situation or rationalization for these measures will be introduced and people will comply because we've been trained. We're being trained, perhaps for our whole lives, we're trained to be essentially compliant. To actually inject something like that under the skin. So um, that's where you need some more persuasion. Yeah. And it's interesting that this concept of universal basic income has been around for around a century where everyone should get some kind of citizen's you know, payment. Uh, but the, the billionaire elites have so far not liked that. But since 2015, they've all come out. I mean, all the, the big billionaires and, and World Economic Forum have come out. Oh, this is a good idea. Universal basic income. Well, why suddenly now? Because now we have the technology for the microchip implant. Um, and so in 2017, Bill Gates came out and said that universal basic income is a good idea, um, but it's too early to introduce it. Now, what was still missing, so we had the technology for the microchip implant, but what was missing was the digital ID hadn't been introduced. How like Bill Gates to acknowledge that something is a good idea, but perhaps not for humanitarian reasons or some sort of economic boost for people that require it, but because it legitimizes the implanting of a piece of technology that will ultimately be used for power. I think there's a kind of an overall tendency towards reducing humanity itself to a kind of block of data, to a sort of a manageable problem. Humanity is a problem that needs to be solved. You need a technocratic class, and in this instance that means a sort of an aristocracy, and in this case a digital aristocracy, a billionaire class of centralized global organizations collaborating with one another beyond the reach of popular democracy or even politics that feels in any way connected to ordinary people, able to make a set of decisions, usually in response to crisis, global crisis, this being a globalist misadventure that's being undertaken, that slowly legitimize measures that are always about introducing a bit more control. CBDCs, more control. Digital ID, more control. Under the skin, more control. 15 minute cities, more control. Ability to stop people traveling, more control. Control. Lockdowns, curfews, unpersoning people, censoring people, cancellations of people, controlling media, censoring big tech. What do you think all these things have in common? And when do you think it will be impossible to hold in your heart? I really appreciate these people. I've got a lot of trouble to help us. They must really love the planet because, God, they're so obsessed with like climate change and ecology and fairness and ensuring that different types of minorities, whether that's sexual or racial or cultural, are well represented and fairness is happening everywhere. Is there fairness over there? No, there's a bit of unfairness. Oh, get a bit of grain of rice, micro rice under the skin right there. It doesn't seem to stack up, does it, anymore? There are a few questions that need to be looked at. Excess death, injury. There's a lot of things that are indicators and clues that it's actually about control rather than care. I've said to you before on this channel that control and care does have a crossover in a natural family dynamic. I have to, to a degree, control my children as part of my care. And that's even on the level of an adult with children, that's a kind of a negotiation and poses moral questions. But it can just about work in anthropologically well understood groups. When you practice this as a scale, when you move power away from people, when all the time you use the language of compassion, the nomenclature of kindness and convenience to alienate us from our conditions and essentially grant centralized authority the right to make decisions far, far away from you, and particularly 
particularly when it's done like, oh, you know, look at this migrant crisis. We have to have digital ID. Let's grant people a universal basic income. But I'm afraid you're going to have to eat your rice. Nicey, nicey, ricey, ricey. How do you like your rice? Embedded in my skin. <laughs> That's how I like it. So I would say remain alert and vigilant to any measures that centralize authority and control in broad ways, particularly if it's posed as somehow protecting or helping you, but places that power beyond the reach of your personal authority and integrity. Because I don't think these institutions primary concern is your convenience and safety. I think it's absolute control. But that's just what I think. Let me know what you think in the comments and the chat. If you enjoyed this, have a look at this. Remember, we stream every single day. Become a subscriber over there. Download the app. Become a member of our community if you can. This movement is becoming increasingly important and uh, I am a pretty limited guy, so I'm going to need help. Stay free. Hey, thanks for watching. If you want to see more uncensored content where free speech can flourish, join our live stream. Click the link right here to watch the next video if you want to or become a member of a growing movement. Download the Rumble app and you'll be informed every time we make a new piece of content. Stay free.